Hello there, I'm Rafael Di Furia, back at it again, but tonight on a Tuesday night for the launch of this new series that I have been promising for a couple weeks now. And tonight is finally the announcement of what that is. And in this new series that is part of the Not Your Average Globetrotter project, I will be speaking with expats and individuals from around the world who have great stories to tell or maybe great information to share for those of you who are thinking about moving abroad. Or maybe even for those of you who are already living abroad, there will be some nuggets of knowledge that will be fascinating to hear. And really, of course, a huge thank you to the patrons who make content like this possible, who allow me to be able to take the time and allow to push forward with this project. Thank you so much to all of you and also, I did want to make one quick clarification. I have been promising that there would be a piece of content, a podcast audio only exclusive that would be uploaded to the podcasting platforms. And on the 11th hour, as I was getting into it, I was advised that there would be a danger involved that uploading this piece of content would actually be a very bad idea. And I did not want to put anybody in danger. I just... I'm not going to go into detail about it, but I do speak about it in a different audio podcast exclusive that I have uploaded that will be live or it should be live at least by the time this video goes out. And I go into a little bit more detail there, but it just overall, I just do ask, please do not ask me to go into detail about the subject just because it's complicated. It's very complicated and I'm just going to leave it at that. But anyway, in this inaugural episode of this part of the Not Your Average Globetrotter Project, we are going to be speaking with Henry, an American expat who now lives in Rio de Janeiro. And not only does he live in Rio, but he lives in one of the favelas of Rio, in one of the most famous slums in the world. And I hate to even use that word slum, but this is possibly an accurate description of what you might call these types of areas. Henry is really such a sweet guy. We had a wonderful time talking, a fantastic conversation. But rather than my telling you about Henry, I'll let Henry tell you about Henry. And just before we get too much deeper into this episode, if you would like to see more content like this, be sure that you are subscribed. And if you are on YouTube, be sure to give this video also a like and share this with your friends. That would be so greatly appreciated because it helps out the channel. Or if you're on iTunes, be sure to give the podcast a a five-star rating or a review to let me know that you've been enjoying this content. And anyway, rather than talking too much more, let's just get straight into it. Hello there, Henry, and welcome, welcome. Uh, greetings from Italy to the beautiful Rio de Janeiro. How are you doing today, man? All right. Today it's a little hot, kind of like uh, Rio 40 graus, uh, feeling like 100 degrees. <laughs> oh, gosh. Let let me see if I can get to the beach this afternoon if it's not too COVID infested. Wow. That's, I mean, what a place to be and have to think about these things. I've been hearing that Brazil has been dealing with some variants and I mean, what a country to get stuck in though. If you're dealing with this, this whole situation, I mean, there's few countries that are more beautiful than, than Brazil. But today, man, I wanted to have a conversation with you because I'm half Brazilian, but I never lived in Brazil. I have been curious my whole life what it's like to actually live in that side of the world. I've heard a lot of stories from my friends and family about what life is like as a Brazilian there, but having grown up in the States, I'm, uh, we'll put it as a, to put it nicely, we'll put it just that I have that American influence in my life. And so I wanted to talk to you to get that understanding of what life has been like there for you as an American in Brazil and who's somebody who's taken on this culture and made it part of your life. So maybe just before we get too much into the Rio side of things, maybe do you want to tell us a little bit about you, where you're from and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm a New York native, actually. <laughs> um, you know, there's a funny thing. A lot of New Yorkers end up getting lost in the world and don't find them their way home. So <laughs> it's... Uh, it's <laughs> It's a real, it's, if you talk to any New Yorkers out in the world, you'll, and, and, and they're in another part and not their city or their state, they'll, you know, you'll really notice that, wow, you guys, you get lost a lot and you don't find your way home. So, Yeah, it's like people um, go to New York, they go and get lost, get found, and then get lost again. And then the New Yorkers <laughs> who are from there, they go and get lost or they find themselves in New York and then get lost again. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> And it's easy. It's easy to get lost in New York. It's not hard. So, uh, <laughs> but, I can um, imagine. So, New York native. Uh, I was um, a teacher in 
uh, in in northern uh, in the suburbs of New York City. Mm-hmm. I was a chef in New York City. I worked for the New York Yankees, and wow. I was a butcher. So I had quite a ride of various works and jobs, and you know, ins and outs. Um, and eventually, you know, as lovely as New York is, you know, um, there's a famous saying: uh, "Leave New York before it makes you too cold," Ooh. and "Leave California before it makes you too soft." Well, I tell you what, New York started to make me really hard. And I had to, I, I couldn't come to California because it's not my style. No. So let me just go to a place I never had any idea about. I had, I had no notion about, which was Rio de Janeiro. And so how was it that you even chose Rio de Janeiro? Because for a lot of people, when they're thinking about moving abroad, they do a lot of research or maybe they have a connection to the city. What was it like in your situation? Well, I'll tell you, what I lacked was research. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I, I was not, I was lacking majorly on the research part. Here's my, my neighbor's dog out here giving a couple, saying hello over here. Shout but, out uh, to the pup. <laughs> shout out to the pup, Poe, here. <laughs> um, no, but in, in reality, um, I had a friend from Facebook and it was called Farmville. This mm. game that we played was called Farmville. And he, he, he said to me, many, many years, come to Brazil. I'm from Curitiba, but come to Rio de Janeiro. I'm living in Rio de Janeiro. And I said, you know, what is, I mean, Rio de Janeiro, what is this place, you know? Right. I, had no, I had no idea there was a Christ statue, seventh wonder of the world, uh, you know, these inc- uh, places like the southern, South American Caribbean no idea of this you know nor did i understand about all of the beautiful people and the culture and the food i just came on a whim and um almost immediately i fell in love (laughs) i can imagine i've only ever been there for a very short period of time and i loved it i fell in love with the country fell in love with the people and definitely fell in love with the food hard to compare to brazilian cuisine (laughs) but I'm just curious because you mentioned before that you were saying that you didn't do that research. That was something that you were lacking in. Is that something looking back on things that do you have any regret about that? Or are you glad that you just jumped in head first? Oh, look, it's always good. It's always good to just kind of jump in sometimes. You know, Mm -hmm. we humans hold ourselves back a lot with the what ifs. What happened? What if something happens bad? What if I, you know don't know the place or what if there's just so many concerns right Mm -hmm. and this can hold us back in our human nature however we are also very curious and we love to explore right so in a sense i'll tell you right now when you're coming to a place like rio de janeiro that's also very um in terms lawless right uh but in any terms just people selling food on the street Right. Yeah, you should you should do your research. You should do your research because these things can have effects on your daily life, especially if you're living here. However, me just coming to Brazil on a whim mm-hmm. was one of the best things I've done with my life. Was probably the best thing I've done with my life. I do wish a little bit of research <laughs> beforehand. <laughs> That's interesting that you put it like that. Looking back on your time, how long have you actually been in Brazil now? Right. So um, I have, when I was here for two years, I would say I was here for four, right? Mm. Now, in the, in, the, in, the, in the grand scheme, in the reality, I've been here for about five years, all right? Wow. Okay. Um, came, Solid came amount here of time. In, yeah, 2016, right? And, um, you know, applied for my, my residency, right? Permanent residency, and got married, you know, and, and have a life and a family um, and a 10-year-old son. And, and not my son, you know, uh, by, by, by birth, by, by blood, but it's my son, you know, by corazón, by heart, by mm-hmm. love, you know. Is it easy Taking, uh, assuming the position of a father and the child that's not yours? It's not easy. 
No, especially but, um, like you're you're in the situation that you're in a new world, you're in a new country, you're new culture. So you really have gone in on the deep end. And also something that we haven't really gone into is that you really are in the thick of it. You are not just in Rio de Janeiro, but you are in a famous what is called favela or what's a better way to say favela in English? Like not a ghetto, but a Honestly, I mean, unfortunately, we don't have a better way. I would say right. what we can do uh, to to reduce the the you know the the preconception of these words uh, is say comunidade, comunidade, mm-hmm. if that's possible, um, because comunidade means community. You mm-hmm. can say in these communities, high mm-hmm. on the hills, in these communities in the north zone, mm-hmm. um, you know, favela is a word that's being uh, taken back by mm-hmm. artists, by musicians, right. right? Yeah, yeah. But it's it still has a dirty, uh, a dirty history, unfortunately. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, I've definitely seen coming out of a lot of um, Brazilian pop culture, especially when we're talking about funk music. I mean, this is like really embracing the favela, and they're talking about coming up and and their lives in the favela, which can be very difficult it's not an easy lifestyle and for many people coming from a first world quote-unquote experience it's really something that's beyond our imaginations how was that for you did you first end up living in a favela or did you work your way i don't want to say work your way down into a favela but work from maybe a nicer neighborhood into the favela? how did that go for you well i worked my way up because Mm. i was down in the bottom in the rich area and I worked my way up and you know uh, you, you, it's it's all a matter of perspective because definitely. you know it's in reality yeah I, I did a downgrade in quality of life mm-hmm. one can say but I actually went up <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll tell you I, I, I actually I came into a place called Itayanga, Itayanga which is right out in the northern tip of Baja, in a place kind of called Tijuquinha. And in this area, it's, um, in the time that I was there, it, there was no, no nothing. It was just a community, there was no factions, there was nothing. Uh, and factions arri- is in like dr- the... Drug dealing, gangs, okay, you know, and et cetera. And that's a subject that maybe we'll get into a little bit later on when we do a part right. two, but just to maybe clarify that point, uh, just out of curiosity and also for those who are watching or listening. Right. Uh, so in this in this community that I had gotten to, it was my first time in here in Itayanga. I remember heading up this set of stairs. I mean, you want to talk about just put it where it put it where you're going to put it. There's no there's no thought process behind it. You know, mm-hmm. it's like I'm building each step at a time. And if one step is five centimeters different or 10 centimeters to the left or f- four kinds of ceramic compared to one kind of ceramic, I mean, that was my, that was the moment I, I just clicked for me here. I said, wow, mm-hmm. this is a place where you can actually survive if you're poor. I mean, hmm. is it easy? Is it easy? No. But I got this feeling in myself saying, look, I'm in, I grew up in a place where if you want to build one, one little shed, just a shed to store your tools in your house, yeah. you have to get a permit. You mm-hmm. have to pay taxes. You have to find, I mean, you name it. So to build a house in USA is, imp- is very difficult. Uh, here, it's just... You have the bricks, you have the sand, and you do what you can do. So I ended up living in the favela, moving mm-hmm. there. That was the first, the first place I stepped foot. You know, was a was a community, was a comunidade, it was a community there, and it just blew me away. Every aspect of it, you know, and the camaraderie between the people, incredible, incredible. So. So just maybe to get into that a little bit, basically what it sounds like you're saying is that there's firstly a lack of city planning, but it almost sounds like a Wild West type of experience where if you can make it, if you can do it yourself, 
then you can just do it. You don't have to ask for permission. You don't have to get really, as long as I guess you're not getting in anybody's way, you can make a life for yourself, even living under conditions that some might not be looking for in life. Right. Uh, re- realistically, a lot of the people in favelas suffer. Mm-hmm. A lot of the people have a lot of trials and tribulations. Substantial mm-hmm. amount of poverty, of mm-hmm. difficulty on a daily basis. But what is incredible, what is humbling, also uh, quite enlightening in every aspect is when you see these people who have almost nothing, mm-hmm. maybe not even a window, just a just a, a brick square, just a brick square in their house, you know? But hey, you know what they're saying? is not that I don't have a window, but that I have this incredible view, Mm -hmm. or that I have a window and I get fresh air every morning, or that I can see the sunrise every single day. Mm -hmm. That is something that you don't get to hear every day from a person who lives in Leblon and in Panima, in some of the most noble areas of Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, so, I've I've been to some of those parts of Rio, and it's, I mean, you can if you it feels like you're in a concrete jungle. But I know I've seen on your Instagram and on your YouTube, and then other YouTube channels where you've been featured, the view from your balcony <laughs> is a forget a million dollar view. That's a billion dollar view. There's nothing like it. And so I'm going to definitely say to anybody who's listening to this or watching this to definitely check you out online and see what you do because, I mean, it's it. Unbelievable. That's the only word that I have to say. <laughs> Thank but you. But I'm just curious, though, like looking at it from like a realistic perspective, and maybe if you don't have the exact numbers, maybe you can give like some kind of range. What does a normal income look like in one of these communities that uh, is similar to yours, uh, or maybe even one that might be a bit more on the rough side, like the City of God, for example, very world famous uh, uh, favela, uh, versus maybe somebody who's living in Leblon or Ipanema? Right. The contrast is quite incredible. And um, let me just go first of all here in Vigigal, uh, in this favela here community we are incredibly lucky with the benefactor of tourism uh, the economy although we suffer from gentrification which is mm-hmm. an increased price of products and goods and services due to the tourism impact but a person here can increase their salary substantially even five to tenfold just from the fact, if they want, if they want, just by the fact of getting out there and selling to tourists who come up every single day, mm-hmm. passing to, to hike and to visit the favela, we have a substantial amount of possibility to continue to grow the economy here. Mm-hmm. The average income here is about a, a minimum salary and a half, a little more, um, on the main road, the people who live inside, on, on, in, the, in the alleyways, a little bit off of the main road, a lot of these people have a similar income to that of City of God. So um, like, what, like numbers wise, what are we talking about here? Minimum salary goes about 1,000, the exact number, you know, they change it every year, right. but it's about 1,200 reais, 1,194. So it's like $200 so. more or less? More or less, yeah. I mean, you know, you're not if you're making over three hundred, you know, you're 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 not doing good per se, but mm-hmm. you're making more than the minimum wage. Really, wow. And um, what's you know what's difficult is that um, people who live in the north zone, they have a very long and difficult and also dangerous communi- uh, commute commute. Mm-hmm. Uh, here in Vigigal, Hosinha, in the South Zone, in these favelas, you might not make a lot, but you just go down the hill and you can arrive at your job. Interesting. So it's a lot easier and it's, it's, it's uh, you know, a little bit more privileged, right? Uh-huh. But in, um, in City of God, there are people there who don't have the option to even make a minimum salary. Mm. There are people there who are, however you say it, uh, 
getting social security, you know, mm-hmm. getting retirement. And this retirement is very little. Mm-hmm. Uh, can be anywhere from 1,000 reais to 2,000 reais or wow. less depending on how much work they put in and money they put into the system. So, because wow. you retire two ways. One mm-hmm. through time and another through the amount of money you put in. Interesting. Very interesting. So, so these these people in city of god they're t- they're not making i mean you you know you can see people on the daily unfortunately com- totally with hunger i mean absolutely mm. starving you can wow. pass these areas and you can see children looking in trash mm. trying to find something to eat and it's a site here in the south zone as well, but it's not like what it is in the north zone, unfortunately. So, so where you live, in, by comparison, people, generally speaking, are doing better just because they have the easier access to get to their work in some of these nicer neighborhoods. Absolutely. And we have tourism. I mean, right. we can have 2,000 to 5,000 tourists arrive here every single day on a weekend. Mm-hmm. So imagine the possibility for somebody who opens up a business selling barbecue on the bottom mm-hmm. or caipiri- or the Brazilian drink caipirinha, you know? Ooh, uh, right. That's some good stuff. <laughs> it's, it, and, and so if you're here in Vijigal or Rocinha mm-hmm. or in Copa, you have that option. But if you're in, if you're in Mare, Mangueiras, if you're in the, the West Zone, you know, or in the center of the city, it's a lot harder. You don't have that option. So I, I guess maybe to touch on a subject that you, you, you got into there regarding security and safety. What's that like living in, in one of these areas? Because uh, unfortunately, one of the ideas that a lot of people have, especially because of what they've seen online from tourist websites and movies and so on, is that they have the belief that Rio and Brazil are not safe. Is there any truth to that? How, how is it for you living there on a daily basis? Look, I mean, I'll tell you right now. Uh, the people who suffer the most here in the city are the residents, not the mm-hmm. tourists. Mm-hmm. If you're a tourist here staying in a hotel, you're not heading out on purpose to the most dangerous areas right? where you have to go back home if you're a resident in mm-hmm. the commute. It's a big difference. So do tourists get assaulted do tourists get robbed yes this happens but let's say a fair percentage of these tourists who do end up getting assaulted or losing their items their phones and wallets are usually because they're doing something that's not very intelligent yeah there's i mean you gotta at at a certain point it's like if you do stupid things stupid things are gonna happen to you that's exactly yeah so you you go into a let's just say for example there's carnival Mm -hmm. and there's people all around you and you decide to hold your phone up like you want to get the view of everyone Mm -hmm. do you really think no one's just going to grab your phone from you (laughs) that's uh, that's an interesting perspective i mean where i live if somebody were to do that I can say that wouldn't happen, but it is interesting to hear that where you live, that is a concern that people, a right. person would or should have. Uh, but then I guess even getting it into a, just a tad bit deeper, because I think this is a subject regarding safety and security that might be better to touch on in the second half. But do you feel safe walking around as a white guy, as an American? Do you ever get singled out? because of your skin color or where you're from like do you get treated a certain way or do people ever try to do something because of of these factors well i have um i've been robbed here in rio Mm -hmm. um ironically once in the favela Mm -hmm. and um ironically uh once outside of the favela in the center of the city wow um and then i was assaulted once in um, Le Blown, actually, right here in the Noble area in 2016. Wow. It was 2016. It was my second day here in Rio. No way. Uh huh. And what um, a welcome was, to Rio. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I, I was a welcome. I was walking down uh, the going to Gavia on a Thursday night. I was going to this thing they call 
Baishu Gavya, which is a festival from the college kids at UR, URF, I can't remember the name of the college, um, the famous state college university here. And all of this, these kids head out to this park and they go to have a party. And so I was walking in a stretch that's totally dark and a young man came out from behind me and pulled on my cable that was charging my phone. I had wow. a battery pack, you know, mm-hmm. and I turned around and I ended up hitting him in the face and I broke my pinky knuckle and this knuckle and wow. he ripped my shirt off from the back and then I ended up having a small like medium fracture here on my nose. Oh my gosh. Um, but he didn't rob me and we ended up having a good fight. And I'll tell you this, if that's something that happens to you where you're going to get robbed, don't fight back. Hmm. There's no cell phone, no, no item that you have in your pocket is worth your life or hmm. a pain in your hand or the possibility of you getting hurt. It's not worth it. Interesting. Uh, maybe we'll revisit that later on because there's a lot more detail that uh, that unfortunately isn't YouTube friendly that it's uh, a bit tricky to deal with. Uh, it is. But maybe 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 taking it a step back, you mentioned also before that you have a family there and you are now a father. How is it for you being in a cross-cultural relationship and how did you meet your wife? <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, cross-cultural relationship. That's a really good word, by the way. I like that. Um, <laughs> you can use it. <laughs> yeah, it's I'm not gonna, mine. <laughs> I, I thought you invented it. Darn. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, realistically, a uh, cross-cultural relationship, yeah. Um, you know, it's very difficult to be a father, And it's Mm -hmm. even more difficult to be a father when there's a language barrier and a Mm. cultural barrier. You're talking just completely different worlds. You know, this is not like, oh, well, I'm I'm in a relationship with a woman that's from the town over in the same state who has a son. No, this is the this is somebody who I've gotten married to who has a son where they lived in Manaus in the in in a, in a city called Ichiquachiare in, in in the Amazon. Wow. You know much So also for more, her like it's a it's a different cultural uh change for her coming from that part of Brazil to Brazil cuz just as a little bit of a um a little background for those people who may be a little bit less familiar with Brazil. It's not like in the United States where we have this huge country and we have a very shared culture. Even though you do get those little regional changes, in Brazil, the region that you're from, the place that you're from, has a very uh, important identity that goes along with it. Like, for example, where my family comes from, they have a very specific identity that is attached to where they are from and those people also are from that area also have that and it's very different from the people in Rio de Janeiro and it's not just a cultural difference but it's also a linguistic difference some of the words that will be used will differ and I'm not saying something like the difference between pop and soda I'm talking even sometimes a little bit of the grammar will change uh, and even the accent will very very much change uh, especially at the ends of words where you have an S, or for example, it'll, instead of saying mais, you'll say mais, or I, I can't mais. even do a proper, I can't do a proper Rio accent because I have a Portuguese accent when I speak uh, <laughs> Portuguese, so I can't do a proper Rio accent, but just to give that little, um, the background, so I'm sorry I interrupted you, you were saying that your wife was from the Amazon, and she's also now, like you, in a new world, in a new place, and now living with a gringo. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's it's a massive, it's a massively different cultural. Uh, you don't have that here in, in even some European nations. You don't have that in USA and Canada. You have um, identities through each state in the USA. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have southern accents and northern yeah. accents and, you know, west coast accents. And there are also words... Uh, in California, you can say something like, um, 
you know, a, a different word completely than something in New York, you know, yeah. how they express cool. Yeah. Um, so here in Brazil, my wife came to Rio, which is a completely different cultural, mm -hmm. uh, cultural aspect and experience than Manaus. In every single way, from work ethic to, to the responsibility of people mm -hmm. to the amount of, you know, um, the population size to just the food, the way people talk. I mean, here's an example. People here say when there's a little kid being bad, a little kid that's very obnoxious, you know, he's a peixe, a peixe, a fish. Mm -hmm. He's a fish. And in Manaus, they say he's a kurumi, like a little kurumi. What's it's like a, a little creature. Oh, creature. A creature. So it's like, it's like, you know, they're just completely different in their aspects, in their words, how they express themselves as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in the Amazon, I'll have a, a person say to me, oh, I'll say to them, you're coming to my party next week? And they'll say, no. I'm not, I can't, I'm sorry. Hmm. But I'm here in Rio, and I say, you're going to come to my party. I'll be there. Right. Party, let's go. It's going to be right. amazing. And the day of my party, not only do they not say anything, they're just gone. So, Interesting. You know, it's, um, and, uh, you know, it very well can be the way the governments are run. It can be mm -hmm. the difference of temperature and the difference of difficulties that each state has. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot. Um, but the differences for us are still an issue to this day. I mean, you know, you can't absorb everything from another culture even in a matter of years. It doesn't mm -hmm. happen that fast. Definitely. It's impossible. People, ha people who write books about different cultures have spent decades in these places absorbing all of that knowledge and that cultural that culture and their experience and they write something incredible i mean i have a, a relatively small amount of time in this country and i do believe that even though i have a relatively sm minimal amount of time that you know through a lot of trials and tribulations especially being inside the favela mm -hmm. and marrying with somebody who is from a completely different cultural background I've gotten a very, very um, in-depth experience, something that a lot of people don't have the possibility to get, even when they spend years here in Rio de Janeiro. Um, you I, know, usually, sorry to interrupt, no, I, just to yeah. add one little thing. Uh, when I first found you online, it was in a YouTube video. I, I think it was from a Canadian guy. I can't remember exactly. Maybe you know Chris. who I'm talking. Yeah, Chris he's a little bit yeah. of a not an older guy, but a little bit older than us. <laughs> I'll put it that way. And yeah. um, when I was seeing you walking and talking, I was like, I couldn't pick it out. It's like maybe he's like me. He's half Brazilian, half American. I couldn't figure it because you've been able to clearly get into the culture and really take it on in a way that a lot of Americans when they move abroad just don't do. Even the way that I've heard you speak Portuguese, it's uh, so impressive to hear <laughs> how you've taken on even some of the colloquialisms that they use in <laughs> Rio and using them and even taking on some of the culture and the laid backness of how people from Rio could be the Cariocas. You've, you've made that part of yourself and that's something that I am so impressed by because so few people <laughs> really do that. I mean, it's really, it's a shame that people don't take on more of their location. And that's something that, from what I've been able to see from an outside on social media, you've been doing an amazing job of that. Well, thank you so much. And the reason why I do tourism is because I want people to actually experience Rio, yeah? like my, my name, my tourism name, Experience Rio, how it should actually be shown. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone has a right to have their own experiences and their own moments. And I'm not saying don't do that, mm -hmm. but I'm saying it's really incredible when you can come to a country and you can step out of your luxuries. Mm -hmm. People travel to another country and what they want, what they want is they want to be able to have all of what they have in the USA and experience the city that they're in or the country that they're in in the way that it's that it that that country is living and that's yeah. impossible 
You can't bring all of your luxury and then expect to experience a country in the way that it should be when when you want to literally be together and it, like I can't I can't explain it how I want to explain it but I'm trying I to I think maybe I don't know just to maybe put some words in your mouth here it's something because I what I've seen from your perspective and the way that you do things I very much feel a similar way that when I go to a place I want to experience the real place I'm not necessarily the guy that goes to the museums I want to see the museum of life I want to see the way that people are living and that's something that from what I've seen what you do in your tourism work you take people into the nitty gritty of course a little bit on guided rails to make sure that they are very safe but also you take them that little step ahead a little step past that point where you can really get to know the people and get to know the place and get to have the full experience because unfortunately especially in a place like Rio de Janeiro it's very easy to get stuck in the Leblons and Ipanemas and just go to the beach go back to the hotel I've experienced Rio. I was like, no, you have not experienced Rio. Even I'll say I haven't properly experienced Rio. I've been close to some of those areas, but I never got into them just because of the people I was with at the time when I was in Brazil. They were very right. protective, and this is a, <laughs> so. It was, they wanted to make sure that the that the the little American kid had a, a nice time there, so they didn't want to put too much <laughs> too right, much right. on me. So, but that's <laughs> I don't know if this is maybe kind of getting if you feel like you're resonating that's with it. this, but I it, am. It, okay, good. I I, I hope I, I I'm so glad to hear it just because. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to get in contact with you because I love that approach that you have because that's very much what I look for when I go to a place. I don't want to go to the restaurant that's on what's one of those websites, Travel um, Trip Advisor. Trip Advisor. I never use those sites. Like I, I don't yeah. even know the names of them because I don't want to know what the tourists right. like. I want to know what the local guy like you likes. Right, and that's and that's um and you know that's the most important thing. And I, I, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Um, you know, when you come to the city, when you come to another place, you know, the best experiences that you have are the ones that are not written up, the ones that are not, you know, where you pay and you have 45 minutes or 15 minutes in a place. Mm -hmm. The best experiences are the ones where you're with someone who's from the city. Mm -hmm. They're showing you something, a family, a person, a place that's not known to tourists you know right. you're immersing yourself in this cultural experience and you know the majority of people who come to rio don't do that like you said they go to leblon they go to copacabana yeah they go to you know uh some they eat some pounji keju that's made like you know in by a massive factory yeah that's cooked by some you know whatever's corner store called like I don't know, Machi, and it, yeah, uh, this is. I mean, look, not but even like just to uh, just maybe playing devil's advocate here, the worst of the palgicaju in Brazil that you'll find is still better than the palgicaju that you'll find even made by a Brazilian who lives abroad. There is something so special about going to one of those little cafes, standing up, telling the woman behind the counter, "Yeah, one or two or however many you want," and. Just sitting there, not sitting there, standing there and eating it. There's something special about that. There is. You're not. You're not. You're not wrong. I'm not a fan of pounji keju. I'm a. I'm a. I'm a. I'm a bad gringo. <laughs> Ooh. So what? You like coxinha, or what are you? What are you more into? Coxinha, yeah. Um, you know, actually, ironically, um, my my favorite thing to eat here in Brazil is popcorn. Popcorn on the street. Really? <laughs> <laughs> because oh, is it because they do the sweet popcorn in Brazil? No, they do the salty. The, they here in Brazil, there's some guy um, that I go to all the time. Mm -hmm. He just loads it up with bacon and he cooks the popcorn in bacon fat. Oh, and it just is. Oh, that sounds beautiful. That sounds next level. I've got to try doing that sometime. Cooking, wow, that is, but, that's a whole new level. But here's the thing is, I don't know how much bacon fat he uses. Bacon fat compared to, uh, you know, uh, to, right. to uh, olive oil. Like, what's the percentage? We don't know, you know? He's got his tricks. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, that, that I love. And 
What I also adore is um, just salgado, but like, uh, you know, like uh, joelho, joelho, like knee, uh, 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 those little ham and cheese kind of breads that oh, they okay. put in the, in the, they bake. Sometimes they put onions and a little I like whatever. a little toasted sandwich kind of thing. Yeah, I Ooh. love these types of things. You can get fat so easily. Oh, it's unbelievable. That's the thing. It's like in Brazil, how do people like, okay, fine. I, I will argue, I will <laughs> say that there are people who just do, are not able to afford the food. But at the same time, the, those people who can afford the food, how are they not all massive? Because the food in Brazil, it's just so, there's so much flavor. And there's a way of, that they do the simplicity, but you get all the flavor from it. Like Brazilian barbecue, for example, only salt, salt and meat. That's just it. Salt and meat. You don't add anything else. But maybe just to compare your life in America to Brazil, what would you say maybe is one of the biggest difference, differences in your lifestyle or something that comes into your day-to-day that you see between the two countries? Well, the, the biggest difference and something that's similar? Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, the biggest difference here in our day-to-day lifestyle, that's, you know, I mean, that's a that's something to think about. But if I can just kind of talk off the top of my head, um, you know, I would honestly say uh, that just the, 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 the poverty is mm-hmm. the biggest difference and the thing that is the hardest to get used to. Because mm-hmm. um, here in Brazil... There's a lot of poverty, but it's not like it's here in Rio de Janeiro. Here in Rio de Janeiro, what's different is that there is a favela or a community, community in any side of anywhere, in any neighborhood of any income, there's a community. Mm-hmm. So in Sao Paulo, you know, you see that famous image. Oh, one second. Sorry. You see that famous image passing all over a famous image passing all over Brazil, all over the world of the favela Perisopolis mm-hmm. um, and the house that's right on the other side. It's the contrast. You have that rich uh, house. That's the fa- yeah. that's in Sao Paulo. But that's not a very uh, constant sight in Sao Paulo. You don't have massively rich neighborhoods per se right on top of favelas and poor neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. You have it in Sao Paulo to an extent, but not like Rio de Janeiro. And in Rio, it's unique in perspective to the entire uh, in the entirety of Brazil, and we don't have any of this in USA. You don't you don't see Leblon, an Alto Leblon, where there's houses to sell for 20 million reais or more, mm. and then within less than a kilometer away or less a half of kilometer. Um, even even five minutes walking, you can sh- arrive in a place called Cruzada, and you can see people who live in apartments of pure poverty, wow. where they have nothing. And you don't see that in USA. The poverty is much more mm-hmm. segregated, and even so, it's hidden. Hmm. Um, you don't have favelas. Where we don't have favelas. Our favelas are right. ghettos. Are just ghettos. Um, big massive brick structures and these brick structures are very ugly on the inside but they're not ugly on the outside and that's the biggest difference in terms of USA life and Brazilian life you know oh 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 Mm -hmm. and throwing toilet paper in the in the toilet in the in the trash bin not not the not the toilet that's a big difference really okay (laughs) Uh, is it is this related to at least where you live because of the infrastructure or maybe lack thereof? Well, this is a, this is a all of Brazil issue, but yes, there are a few forty percent of the entire population of Brazil roughly can actually flush their toilet paper and not uh, create damages to the wow. infrastructure of sewage treatment. Uh, Toilet paper causes detrimental impact on the sewage systems in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, That's it is very interesting. A huge problem. 
Wow, something so simple. <laughs> I know also here in Italy, uh, they do say in some places, like, don't flush your toilet paper, or that you shouldn't do it, especially some apartment buildings with older pipes, they say not to do that. So maybe also just taking that comparison between the USA and Brazil, is do you ever miss living in the United States or do you ever regret that you left? Do you, would you like to even take your family and bring them to the United States one day? Oh, look, that's a very, you know, it's a good question. Uh, do I miss USA? Of course I miss USA, of course. Um, it's a beautiful place. It is a land that has immense beauty, natural beauty, um, natural resources. A lot of people have opportunity there. Um, but, you know, one thing that I just, or something that I just truly don't miss is that I'm from a nation that is the richest nation or one of the richest nations in the world. I believe it is the richest nation in the world. It has the most billionaires and the most millionaires. And it, it, it has some of the largest corporations in the world. And it, it is home to the richest human being in the world. So I'm in it from a nation where, in a city where New York City has 50,000 homeless people. 50,000 homeless people. And probably about 40% of those homeless people are military vets. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm, a, I'm an American expat, American citizen living in Brazil, and I miss it substantially and a lot, a lot, a lot. Saudade, saudade, né? Um, and that feeling of, of, of all of that, me missing this, is totally negated, is negated by the fact that if I go to USA, Will my son be able to go to college without getting fifty or a hundred thousand dollars in debt? Mm -hmm. Or if my son has an issue with his health, will we be a hundred thousand or more dollars in debt because he mm -hmm. needs an operation or a surgery? Mm -hmm. um, these are my do I do I do I feel comfortable thinking, well, should I move back to USA? We have a ton of privileges. We'll be able to buy the newest iPhone mm -hmm. for the cheapest price in the world. But we will not be able to get my son free education and will not mm. be able to guarantee my son the right to health care if he has an issue with his health. So I miss USA, but I don't believe, at least in the meantime, that I will go back there with my family. So it really but, sounds like you feel like you made the right choice and that it is the better choice out of the two countries, in some respects, <clears throat> at the very least. Yeah, I mean, Brazil has a ton of issues, um, you know, and what country doesn't have a ton of issues? Um, a lot of countries have issues, but, you know, I mean, it would be, would, 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 is Brazil my best option? Uh, what, was it my best option to, to move to? I don't know. Maybe not, you know, but um, it happened. I'm here, you know, we're here having this conversation today. Right. And, um, you know, trying to at least. <laughs> <laughs> With how many times you tried to make this happen, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and so, you know, and that's frustrating, you yeah. know, because I'm here and I could be in USA right now with mm -hmm. two gigabytes a second and we could yeah. have this come no problem with yeah. no issues. But instead, um, you know, we're here on this fight with slow Wi-Fi. So, right. yeah, there's always things to complain about and there's always things to gripe, grip, gripe about. But, you know, in the grand scheme, I, I do believe it's a better place here in mm. Brazil for me. Not saying for every gringo, every tourist, every foreigner, but for me, yeah. No, and that's I, you raise a very good point there that it's extremely important that you do what's right for you because the right choice that may be for me to live in Italy might not be right, right for the right choice for you or the right choice for you to live in Brazil might not be the right choice for me. Uh, but even, I guess, going on from that point and kind of building off of that a little bit, that Americanness that you hold on to, when we first spoke, you mentioned something very interesting to me that I've definitely gone through about your ability to kind of relate to the American community, but also that you don't fully relate to it. And also the same goes for the Brazilian community and your ability to kind of float between the two communities and be living in 
in your ta- your part of Rio de Janeiro where you are immersed in your in that culture, but then also kind of be able to float into another sector of life, so to speak. Yes, and that's also a nightmare. <laughs> um, so just just think about it like this: you're an expat from the USA, and you. Uh, Current, I, I currently have the right to vote, and I believe you do as well, right? Yeah, definitely possible. Right. So here's the thing. I can vote in USA, and if I, I, I did vote, actually, uh, this year in this presidential election. I voted, okay? And uh, I might take flack for it, but I voted for Joe Biden, all right? Keep trying to keep politics out of everything. Can cut this out. I have no problem. But in in the in the in the grand scheme of, of what happened was, I want to vote, and I have people telling me, no 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 no. I have friends. I have family members. You abandoned your country. You abandoned your nation. You don't have the right to vote. Why are you right. voting? You shouldn't. You, you should. You should be. Are you serious? This is voter fraud. It's voter mm. fraud. You're voting. You don't even live there anymore. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So. Why should you have a say in what happens in the country that you don't live in? And so now I live in Brazil, and I want to go vote. And I went to vote in my community on Sunday. And I'll tell you, this just happened to me on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I went down. I went to vote for the president of the Residents Association here. I have have CPF. I'm a legalized permanent resident here in Brazil. I have a son, a wife. I live in this community for years. I know the issues and the problems in this community, just like anyone else. And let me tell you, I had a guy come to me behind me and said, who are you voting for? And I said, well, it's none of your business. And he said, oh, you're not even from here. Ah, you shouldn't even be voting. Wow. You don't have the right to vote. You're not, you're not from Brazil. You're just some gringo here leeching off of our, of our, of our community. What are you doing? Why? So That's I'm in a limbo fascinating. in the middle of a no man's land because I have my nation, my mm. home country, telling me, no, you can't vote because you're a traitor. And I have here telling me, no, you can't vote because you're not, you're not a Brazilian. Mm-hmm. So it's a, yes, yeah, so did I vote? Of course I voted. And, mm. I, said, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I said to the guy, I said, you know, shut up, literally, <laughs> you know? Uh, no, but, I mean, like, the thing is, there's a certain level, I mean, Depending on, I'll definitely get into that side of the argument where it's like, look, if you're not a citizen, if you're not there legally, then maybe should you have that right to vote? There, I, I would say there's definitely a question there. But if you're legal to be there and if you're able to actually be a part of that community and you've immersed yourself into it, then why shouldn't you at least have a say, at least what goes on on a local level? But I guess kind of going into that little bit of Americanness. uh do you feel alone ever living in your neighborhood? Do you feel isolated? Or are there other Americans or other expats that are living close by? I do, I do. I'll tell you right now. Um, there are moments as a, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a resident here in Brazil that I feel very, very isolated. Mm-hmm. And it's not because I don't have friends and I don't have family it's because of the cultural differences. Interesting. It's not because I'm, uh, I have many friends here and I have people that I would actually say would do almost anything for me. I have, I, I have friends here that are considered brothers mm-hmm. and um, people that I love, you know? Um, and uh, that's not the issue. The issue is always the cultural difference. You know, there's some times where you just can't see eye to eye on something that somebody mm-hmm. believes in or says. Sometimes you just can't relate to something that somebody does or that somebody or something that somebody wants to do. Mm-hmm. And you just you feel like, wow, you know, where do I belong here? Mm-hmm. You know? And and that's I think something that a lot of expats a lot of foreigners might suffer with quite a bit, mm-hmm. um, you know, because sometimes we try to adapt in every aspect to the culture, and that's not healthy. We can't forget our past, mm-hmm. you know. We have to integrate with society here, but we mm-hmm. also, um, what I do for me to 
to negate this feeling of isolation is, as you asked, do we have other expat people in this country? Will we in, or in this favela? We do. So I have some expat friends, and I, I, I invite them here. We have some days where we talk about, you know, USA subjects and issues, and we have a, you know, something, some food from USA. Like, I'll tell you something that made me a little bit isolated, which was so 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 small. Mm-hmm. I made a lasagna. I made a lasagna. Mm-hmm. And here in Brazil, they put ham in lasagna, and I think it's I think it's disgusting. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah, I I can't say I would be so into that. Ham in lasagna for me is like a crime. It's like putting mustard in a hot dog. I just well, you're also Italian American, aren't you? Yes. So I am. you're a good Italian boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. My wife would say no. <laughs> <laughs> but so here, you know, I say to my friends, I say to my friends, guys, I'm not going to put ham in this freaking lasagna. I'm not right. going to do it. It's not happening. It's a crime and against it. It's a crime against Italian. It's a, cr- a crime against yourself. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I understand so, you, brother. I feel your pain. <laughs> ah, thank you. So that's the issue. And I said to them, but then so on the real talk, they all were like, you don't you don't know what good lasagna is. You're 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 crazy. Like no. you, don't know how to, you don't know how to cook lasagna. You, no. you know, like this is the only way. This is the best way. And then really? I felt I got I got to I got depressed. Call it crazy. Call it silly. Call no, it stupid. It, it, there's a, but I it, did. it makes sense. It makes sense. I get you, you on know? that. I've had similar situations where it can be the smallest little thing might make you feel like, wait, hold on. What am I? Who am I? What am I doing here? What's what, how do I fit into all of this? Like, and it can be that thing that is so simple, just that one little ingredient in that one dish, and it's like the the straw that breaks the camel's back. I guess is probably yeah, the best yeah. way to put it. Yeah, that happens to me quite a bit. These little tiny things, you yeah. know, it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> no, I, I can definitely relate to that. Although, just because you're Italian American, I have to ask. I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but have you ever looked into living in Italy or Italian citizenship, any of those subjects? I have um, years ago. So my father passed in 2013, Mm. um, but I still have a lot of family in Sicily and in southern Italy. Um, And so I have an uncle, Frank, who's still alive and... Recent, not not recently per se, but you know, a few years ago, he said, "Why don't you go to Italy and stay with our family and get to know them? You know, mm. this is an entire side of your family that you've never met." Yeah. Um, you know, and my father's parents, uh, uh, they died when they were, when he was a, when he was young, so I never met my father's my my grandparents on my father's side, and. Our our Italian history is very um, kind of sporadically hidden mm-hmm. for some reason. But what one thing that I do know about our our Italian history is that we do have a pope in our family. Wow! Um, so uh, I think in the fifteenth sixteenth century, because it's fifteen hundreds, fifteen hundred fifteen hundred eighty eighty something. He was Pope for six years, uh, Pope, uh, I forget his name, Vinicius Montalto V or something. Um, So, and it's real. We actually, I did a family tree. That's so cool. Yeah. So, you know, I I don't, I'm not in touch with my, my Italian side, but I am dying to visit. I am a sucker for Italian food, true Italian food. Yeah. You know, um. And the culture just looks incredible. So yeah, no, it, um, as an, as somebody of Italian descent, it's it's your birthright. You gotta you gotta get to know it. So if you ever end up out here, you definitely have to let me know. We're definitely gonna meet up in person. Oh you're, you're gonna have to be my tour guide Ooh. to show me around. Now that's a responsibility. Take being the tour guide's tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> but yeah, no man. Anyway, I guess kind of bringing it back to your experience in Brazil, just taking that little that little sidetrack, just because 
something right. that I'm, of course, very, very passionate about, very curious about, and definitely like open to talking more about. And maybe we should do another episode sometime. I mean, definitely we're doing a part two anyway, but maybe even in the future do another uh, chat together. But um, I'm just curious, though, if someone were to think about living in Brazil and doing something like what you've done, would you tell them, no, you're crazy, don't do it? Or, hey, yeah, give it a try? I, I would say, I would say, give it a try. Mm. Uh, do you know why? Because if you're going to, if you're going to give it a try, you're a person who's open, you have an open mind. You know, uh, if you're already thinking about it as the possibility, then you're not somebody who's going to go stay in li- just some fancy hotel in Copacabana. Right. So, if it's something that you're interested in, if it's something that even just piques the interest 1%, give it a try. Research it. Talk to me. Watch this video that, you know, and, and the second part, you know, um, you know, because there's a lot of insight and there's a lot of wild things that happen. Um, it wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. <laughs> but, um, you know, it wasn't easy. But I'm... I am, I am truly and genuinely comfortable and happy in my situation in life. And it was something I can say that I was not when I was in New York in the United States. Interesting. Did you feel as though maybe, like even taking it from a practical level, did you feel as though maybe you were more financially comfortable there or that wasn't even a factor for you? Uh, look, you know, I was working a lot in the USA. In the end of my time, I was working substantially. Um, I had become burnt out, just mm-hmm. exhausted. I couldn't, I couldn't keep up with all of the, you know, the hustle and bustle of the city, the work pace, and the lifestyle. And um, I needed to be somewhere else. So I was more financially comfortable in the USA. Mm-hmm. I would say in in terms of luxury mm-hmm. if I wanted something like that was something I don't know cell phone nice TV you know good clothes that were of uh, Adidas all of that was much more financially accessible in the mm-hmm. United States here I am more financially stable in terms of my finances Right, hmm. much more than I was in USA. Interesting. But the op- the option to purchase things and to have more luxury, a hundred percent, is in the United States. Interesting. Here is not is not the place for 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 luxury in terms of you know technology and all these brands and mm-hmm. all these cars. So it's, it's more that expensive. you're gaining that lifestyle rather than maybe some of the kind of those beautiful moments that you can have with another person rather than being able to go and buy a, a car or a, an iPhone, like 20, te- the iTone, iPhone 20 X and with all the bells and whistles and all exactly. of that stuff, you're, you're gaining more life experience from those special moments being able to say, Hey, I think I'm going to go down to the beach today. The beach of Rio de Janeiro, one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. One of the, arguably the best beaches in the world without a doubt and so you there's it sounds like what you're saying is that there's this trade-off between the two and even i can say living in italy that's something that i've gone through that maybe certain things in the u.s could have been better but what i get in return i definitely have that preference so maybe even kind of on that same line of thinking what would you say would be the biggest benefit of living in in Brazil or if there's not just one maybe your top 3 oh the just uh f- i would say um still to this day food cost is very very good food mm-hmm. cost and quality i mean you know the the amount of things that are not over processed or processed with just junk is much less here than in USA. That's a good mm-hmm. benefit for your health and and a lot of other things, right? The second thing I would say is the beaches, the nature. I mean, the beauty is incredible. Um, you know, you drive 
an hour outside of the city and you're in some of the most incredible places that you can be in the world. Um, and I mean that. Um, and the third thing I think honestly would be the fact would would realistically for me cold beer <laughs> that's that's a pretty good one i i gotta say brazil's got some, i'm not a beer drinker i don't like beer me neither but brazilian beer there is something about it and also actually even just the way that Brazilians enjoy the beer is a little bit different than how I've seen in other countries where you might have a can of beer or a bottle of beer and that goes to each individual person. But that one can of beer or that one bottle is communally shared. We all have it together. We are all taking part of this. Not here's your beer, here's my beer. That one Corona, that's for all of us. We're all taking part in that and that's something yep. that I love when I'm hanging out with my Brazilian friends that we're just it's this kind of I don't want to say co-op hippy dippy kind of community thing but like it's nice having that sense of we're all here enjoying the same thing as as far out and strange as that may sound no it's not strange you're actually you hit the nail on the head I mean the community uh, in Rio in itself is also something quite incredible. I mean, uh, you go to USA and you, you buy a 40 ounce of beer mm -hmm. and that 40 ounce is for you. And then yeah. your other friend gets a 40 ounce. But here we get four 40 ounces and we're just opening one at a time for every yeah. single person. And that's awesome. Um, yeah. It is. It is. It's, uh, you know, it's very communal. It is kind of yeah. hippie-ish. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. I mean, but the thing is, it, it, it makes a sense uh, kind of because so many of the people in Brazil have struggled for so long. It's like, hey, let's pull this together and see what we can make better together. And kind of from that struggle yeah. of like l that it's almost necessary that people come together in that way that it, it really is. It shows a very beautiful side of of humanity and what it can be even when it's at its, I don't want to say when it's at its worst, but when you put it into a situation that is less than ideal. Right. Some of what I hear about coming from, from these types of places like where you live in, in Brazil, it's amazing how people can really come together. And even what you were explaining to me, I, I think is worth going into a little bit about how the, the government doesn't really take part in what's going on in your area, but the local people will actually come together and form these committees or organizations to make sure that the, the, that the area is taken care of at least on some level and even on a social level to make sure that people have food sometimes if it's at all possible or medicine or whatever it may be or clothing. Maybe is that something you just want to quickly touch on? Yeah, yeah, uh, quickly. Um, so realistically here, the gov favelas, communidades are completely abandoned by the state. Uh, work, majority of the works that were done in favelas were done decades ago, 30 years ago or more. So right now, in the last 30 years, almost nothing has been built and they've been left pretty much untouched. So the people, the residents, they've a lot of them have almost banded together and created associations, created... Um, you know, organizations and NGOs, etc., to basically um, charge the government to, to basically uh, basically say, "Hey, federal government, state government, right. we're here. You've abandoned us. We need help." And so, instead of just one person or two people or three people every day going to the sending messages and sending emails to the state or to the mayor. They have an association, they have a group of people that are able to collectively organize and to work hard to change this. And so one thing, one, one extra step further, inside some favelas there is a news journal, news organization really, um, called Voice of the F Community, Voice uh -huh. of the Community. It's called Vaz das Comunidades and it's a friend of mine named Hene Silva. Hene was 16 years old, was on GQ, and he ended up becoming one of the GQ's most influential people when he was 16 years old in the wow. world. He created this, this uh, magazine that is 
based off of the people and for the people and by the people. Now this passes by through over 15 favelas, more than 20 favelas throughout all of Rio. Amazing. It has, it has various teams um, equip, equips, uh, that go to all areas when there's police operations and when there's violence or when there's good things too and happiness. And this media organization is something that is created from the inside. So as we were saying is that it helps alleviate the, the, the downfalls, the stresses and the, di- the difficulties in the favela by helping, uh, you know, put a little fire to the feet of the, 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 the governor and the mayor and these types of people. So people of the favela um, work quite hard to reduce the, the prejudice against them and to increase the amount of beneficial construction projects and works that happen in the community. And so I think actually this starts to touch on something that's part of your work and what you do with your tourism. And maybe just do you want to talk a little bit about your 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 travel guide business that you have there? Yeah, um, you know, actually I used to work in, so I started working in tourism and um, I went into public security and I started working for a journal called The Rio Times. I had passed and I would head up in favelas during operations mm-hmm. um, and keeping it YouTube, uh, keeping it YouTube rated positive um, outside of what would happen in that. Um, I ended up going into tourism because I had seen the sadness, the tragedy and the devastation that happens in these communities. And I said, well, what can I do? What can I do to not just take someone up the main road of a favela? to a club that doesn't give back to the community. Um, what can I do? How can I, how can I help the people in this, in this place throughout all of the city? Is it possible? In reality, it's not possible. I can't help everyone. But I can help one person, two people, three people, you know, and, and continue doing this. So I decided, look, let me start working with people in the favela. Mm-hmm. Let me make friends with this person who owns a little restaurant here and with this guy who's a motorcycle taxi driver. And I'll say, hey, you want to take these four tourists on a tour? Mm-hmm. Drive them around on the motorcycle and I'll pay you five times what you make. You know, wow. And these guys, they receive extra income. They get to be in videos and to be shown on YouTube. They get to show their community in a way that's not just bang, bang yeah, or, yeah. you know, unfortunate. Yeah. And it's something that gives back in a lot of senses, not just monetary, not just yeah. an income. And positive imagery, positive, mm-hmm. you know, visual experiences for these people to say, hey, it's not just violence. Mm-hmm. So my tourism was created through that kind of channeling and realizing I can't be a leech on the society where I live in. I can't be a tick, a sukasangi, sucking the blood of these, these people, just taking the income from the resident, from the tourists who come in here. No, let's give back. Let's help uplift the people under that are below us, that are mm-hmm. suffering, you know? That's a really cool approach, and even in in one piece that I saw that you were a part of, the guy just helped one of your friends to build his little business, to to have his little kiosk, and to make something in his life, and that was something to me that was so beautiful to see. Because for me, like I always, my heart always goes out to anybody from Brazil, just because of like that's where my family came from, and that's a life that may not have been too far off from what. If I were born in a different country, that could have been, that could have been me in some respect. So I feel blessed that I've been given the life that I have. And so if I'm ever able to bring attention to some of these issues or some of these factors, or maybe even indirectly make a difference in somebody's life, that's why I, I would love to do something. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on. Also, apart from my own personal curiosity, that if there's even just one person that finds you from my videos and says, "Hey, I want to go on your tour," like. 
I, I, not that I've been on your tour, but I just really have an appreciation for what it is that you do and for the positive light that you shed on such a beautiful world that unfortunately does have a heavy cloud over it. Not a real cloud. I mean, if, even looking behind you, just it's right. the, the sunshine. It's a beautiful <laughs> it's place, beautiful. but but uh, but speaking uh, in a sense that there is a very dark side to some of this beauty, and it's just a part of the reality that people go through. And even like where my family is from, by comparison to Rio, especially and in Brazilian terms, it's considered a very safe place. But still, in the middle of the night or late at night when you're driving around, you don't stop at a stoplight You just because yep. you don't know. There are those little factors, and I've mentioned this in my videos before, just very lightly, and this is something that we'll definitely dive deeper into in the second part. But just before we get to that second part, maybe to wrap up this first part here, how can people get in contact with you? And if they want to find you and, and join you on your tour when things are back to something that resembles normal, where yeah. can they find you online? So they can find me on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Main The main subject that I use is Instagram. Experience Rio in English. Very, very easy. Um, and you can search me through any of that. Or you can just send me through my website, which is www.experience-rio.com. Perfect. Um, and after and this, I'll make sure that you send me like all your links and stuff, and I'll definitely put it in the in the more info section and show notes so that people can get in contact you with you. Of course, Ermo. Of course. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so we are going to wrap up this first part. So for those of you who are watching, hope you've enjoyed this so far. And we are going to dive into some content that unfortunately isn't YouTube friendly that sheds light on some of the other realities of life in Brazil and and uh, what Henry has seen and what things can be like there. But that is going to be an audio podcast exclusive. So make sure that you go check that out on your podcasting platform of choice. Of course, you can go check that out on notyouraverageglobetrotter.com or my website, rafaeldifuria.com. We'll